Welcome back to Prep Station Economics. Let me ask you this question. What factor of production am I? Am I land, labor, capital, or entrepreneurship? Well, you know the answer already. I am labor because I provide my service. Well, today we're going to talk about the demand and supply of labor, or what we simply call labor markets. The people markets, where we buy people. Oh, of course we don't buy people there. Of course, but indirectly we buy their skills. Okay, so let's talk about this quickly. We don't have to differentiate between demand and supply of labor. So what is different between a laborer and, and the laborer? A laborer is a person per se, and labor is the skill of the person. I'm employed not because of my face, of my body structure, of my tribe. I'm employed because of what I can simply do. If you remove what I can do for me, I will no longer be employed. So people employ people based on what they can do, not because of what they are. But you can't separate what I can do from, what I, from who I am, so that's why you have to get the two together. Okay, good. So that's what explains us about labor and labor. So labor is human efforts at work, and um, labor is a person who is engaged in physical work. So let's talk about this. The difference between demand and supply of labor, because demand and supply of labor bring about what we call labor markets. Of course, we've learned about demand and supply before. L the market is what determines demand and supply. But in this case, we're talking about demand and supply of labor, not for goods and services. Oh, services, because that's labor. So what is demand for labor? Demand for labor is talking about the desire and the need for workers by employers. People want workers, they demand for workers. And supply of labor is talking about the availability of workers willing to work. So now these two combined make up the market for demand and supply of labor. Can you, from this picture you have on your screen, can you spot who is the demand for labor and who is the supply for labor? Of course, the woman who is doing the interview and the person um, who is conducting the interview would be the demand for labor, the person who is doing the interview trying to get a job will be the supply of labor, the person is willing to work. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about labor market and labor force. We've known the labor market, the combination of um, demand and um, supply of labor, but what is the labor force? Labor force is talking about the number of people that are willing to work and they are able to work and they are working. Labor force is talking about the number of people that are willing to work and able to work. Now, some of these people that are willing and able to work, some of them are working. Some of them are not working. But if you are willing and able to work, you're part of the labor force. Whether you have a job or not, whether you are employed or unemployed, then you're part of the labor force. Now, if you want to get a, a simpler definition or formula for that, you can simply say unemployed plus employed. The unemployed and the ones that are employed. Now, you might ask me, who are those that are not employed, the unemployed? These are people that are willing to work. They are looking for work, but they've not gotten a job yet. A baby is not willing to work. A baby is not ready to work and is not even looking for a job. If you're a student, you're not willing to work, you're not ready for a job, you're not part of the labor force. But if you're willing to work, you are done with school, you have some kind of um, skill, then you are part of the labor force, even if you don't have a work. Now, one more question to make you understand this properly. A person who is very rich or maybe from a rich home, and the person is not willing to work because the person has like millions or billions in his or her account. The person is not considered as part of the labor force because the person is not willing to work. The person is not ready to work. The person just wants to have a good life. And the person can afford it does not mean the person wants to work. So you have to know the difference between this carefully. Let's talk about the factors that affect the size of our labor force. Since our labor force is talking about the people that are willing to work and people that are able to work, looking for work actively. Now, what kind of Factors can determine the size of those people in Nigeria. Like how many people are even willing to work in Nigeria? How many people are able to work in Nigeria? Number one factor there we can look at is the official school leaving age. At what age are people allowed to leave school? Because people go to school to acquire a skill, to acquire a, um, a, a trade, and they can use that to work. So the question is, at what age are they allowed to leave school? In Nigeria, I think the school leaving age, at least for um, people who have secondary school living certificates, maybe at the age of 16, 17, 18. So at the, from age, age of 16, 17, 18, I think you're allowed to work. And that, that would not be considered as child labor. Because if, if you ask a child of 10 to work, that's child labor. The child is not supposed to be working. That's illegal. We have to understand the difference. Because if a four-year-old, for example, if a 10-year-old or a five-year-old is willing to work, does not mean that the person should work because it's not of working age. So another one that we can consider as well is um, population. Now, the bigger the population, the bigger the labor force. The smaller the population, the smaller the labor force. Because if you have 100 million in a country, this simply means the labor force will be big. 
But if you have 100,000 people in your country or 300,000 like the Vatican City, you definitely have a smaller proportion of people that are willing and able to work. Okay, so that's not all. We also have another thing here. We have um, the retirement age. When people do retire, also affect their labor force when they are when they should work. Because um, if more Nigerians are retiring at the age of 70, it means our labor force will reduce. But if we shift that to maybe 80, and I'm not saying that's positive, I'm just saying if we do that, then we have more people willing to join the labor force because we will not kick them out of the labor force on time. But in many countries, the retirement age is quite lower than 75. Uh, and in some countries, countries is actually way much higher than 70. Okay, so that's not it. We still have we all, we still have more. Also, we're talking about migration. We have so many Nigerians leaving the country, Japa syndrome, and they're going to other places. The more they go, the more the less our labor force. Because if skilled doctors, if skilled lawyers, if skilled teachers are going to other countries to get better living, then our labor force is reducing, is shrinking. Of course, but don't forget, the more people leave Nigeria, more people are also coming to Nigeria. Of course, foreigners are, are everywhere. They are also coming here to have a work, um, a trade, start a business, employ people, like just like that. But we all know in a country like Nigeria, we have more people leaving than people coming in. So migration is a very important factor that affects the size of labor force. Now, the next one is the hour of working, the number of working hours and them um, days. In a place like Nigeria, um, normally we have about five days of work, like Monday to Friday. I'm just saying this based on my opinion and based on my observation. It might not be the same for every Nigerian, but we have about five days of work. We have Monday to Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays are considered as weekend. You might think of an extra job during that period, but in some countries, as a matter of fact, they have like shifts in like morning work, like night work. Some people go, they work all through the night. I mean, across many industries. And they even work on the weekends, they work on Saturdays, they work on Sundays. They're not so religious like some African countries or some European countries as well. So the point is the number of working hours also would affect what is being done. Uh, okay, so that's not it all. We still have more. Of course, they... Actions of government too would also matter. The government involvement, the government policies will also determine the number of people that are working. If government shifts up the retirement age, then more people would work. If government allow more students, if government changes the education system and says, you know what, instead of having four years in the university, you can have three years, it gives more people a chance to work. If government scraps NYC, for example, and says there's no need for NYC, and that means more people can work as soon as they leave the university, they don't have to spend another extra one year, maybe on internship or learning a skill or still trying to prepare themselves for work, but they can just start working immediately. Or maybe sh many, many policies can create, um, they can increase the size of our labor force. And we still have more factors that can do that. And this one is very important to me because it talks about the role of women in the society. The role of women in our society determines the number of people that can work. We already have many men working. Yes, most men are working. But if more women are allowed to work, if more women are encouraged to work, then the size of our labor force will definitely increase, certainly increase. Very okay, good. So, there are, so these are just some of the factors. But now we also have factors that determine our wage rate. How much do we charge for the work we do? Um, do we charge millions? Do we charge thousands? Don't forget that the, the force of demand and supply are applicable here. But there are many factors that can determine how much you earn. But I'm just going to talk about some of these factors. You have to just see the examples around you. Number one is gender. Yes, um, it's, it, it's, it's known that uh, at some point in some ways that um, males are more paid than females. But there are reasons for that actually. It's not as if it's like deliberate or it's not, it's not something that has to do with um, male, male dominance, but it's economical because the job that males do and jobs that females do sometimes are quite different. And the industries they work in are also different. Uh, in the school sector, cannot be compared to the construction industry. So another one is trade unions. Trade unions also matters. Where we have trade unions, active trade unions, people have more um, take-homes because example is um, you barely have an active teachers um, association, but you have a more active, uh, more robust um, lecturers association. You you might have a more stronger trade union in in the medicine um, industry, but you might have a less um, strong 
association in the construction industry. The another one is negotiation. That is individual people negotiate how much they want to earn. And also education as well, the skill, the, the knowledge they have acquired, as well as the experience which goes along with the education and the product type, the kind of product they are trying to produce. Now, the risk they also take, you can't expect us to pay the same amount we pay to a, to a, to a, to a pilot as the same amount we pay to um, a, uh, maybe a mechanic. The risk involved, the, the, the mortal risk involved is quite different for both parties. Another one is the cost of living, because sometimes um, in different societies we have higher cost of living and therefore people ask for more wage rate. Same way with policies. So we've explained the factors that determine our wage rate in Nigeria. There are still more factors, but these are my factors. So we can still think of other factors as well and um, share that with um, the prep station or share that with your friends or anyone. Very okay, good. So let's talk about um, being underemployed and being unemployed. What's the difference between the two? Underemployed simply means you're not you're not working up to your capacity. Well, you're, you're, you probably are skilled or taught or educated or trained for something better or something higher, but you're doing less than that. So that's what we talk about in that regard. Okay, so Phones is a game programmer by qualification and she works as a sales girl for a popular game store. Is she underemployed? Yes, she's underemployed because she is better, she's suited for a better job than the one she's doing at the moment. Very okay, good. What about this one? Wounds is paid 45% less than what an average model is paid in Nigeria because our company is new. Is she underemployed? Of course, the answer is yes, she's underemployed. Let's get another question. Zone studied law at the University of Calabar. She currently earns millions of millions working as a food taster on social media. Is she underemployed? And the answer is yes, she's underemployed because she studied medicine. So she studied law instead. Okay, good. And this one says Tones works part-time for a coffee shop and is looking for an additional job, although he's schooling for the time being. Which best describe him? Is he underemployed, um, unemployed, or both? Well, the answer is underemployed. Is not unemployed because he's looking for another job and he has a part-time job at the moment. But the part-time job makes him underemployed anyway. So let's talk about types of unemployment. So if you're unemployed, what are the types of unemployment? We have so many types. The first one is fictional unemployment, which means the time gap, the time difference between when you look for a job and when you get the job. Okay, you have a job, you quitted your job or you resigned, and um, you, it took you about two months to get another job, then that means you are fictionally unemployed. Residual unemployment, you can see from the picture right here, the person is on a wheelchair. And that means the person cannot walk, um, or maybe can walk, but the point is that whenever you, have, uh, you are handicapped or you have a disability that can stop you from walking, then you are residually unemployed. The next one is seasonal unemployment. This is talking about um, when there is a season. There, there are seasons where people become unemployed. There are seasons where people become employed. I don't know if Santa Claus has a job, but if Santa Claus has a job, that means that yeah, during festive periods, Santa Claus is employed. For off festive period, maybe not. But there are jobs that come with certain seasons. Okay. Structural unemployment is talking about um, being unemployed because of the demand for your skill. Now, many people have been, be, have been rendered unemployment in the banking industry simply because their skill are no longer or skills are no longer required or necessary in that field. We, we have a lot of um, technological advancement, we have a lot of ideas, a lot of processes have taken out people from that space. We have ChatGPT, we have um, AI tools, we have so many other machines, there are drones, that, that are not allowing people, that are making people not needed anymore in many industries. Okay, and last one we have is cyclical unemployment, talking about in terms of the cycle of the society, of the economy. When there's an economic boom, when there's more money in the economy, yes, more employment. But when there's a recession or a depression, there's less um, unemployment. That's what we call cyclical unemployment. So let us look at this. In Nigeria, about 6 million are in school, 50 million are in search of jobs, 25 million are retired, 45 million are working, 35 million are females, 40 million are males. These are just assumed. What is the size of Nigeria's labor force and employment rate? Well, the first question is, what's our labor force? 6 million people are in school. They're not Labor, part of the labor force because they are, they are not employed and they are unemployed. They're not unemployed because they are not willing to work. 50 million are in search of jobs. They, those ones are unemployed because they're looking for jobs. 25 million are retired. Those ones are not unemployed because they don't want to work. They are done with working. 45 million are working. Those are the employed people. Those are part of the labor force. 25 million are females. 40 million are males. We don't really need 
anything to do with we don't have anything to do with this data because just knowing what if they are males or females does not mean they are employed. So the size of our labor force is 60 million, that is 45 million plus 15 million. That gives us 60 million. And if you want to calculate the employment rates, that simply means that we look at the number of people that are employed, which is 45 million, divided by the no total number of labor force, that is 60 million times 100. And the value for that is 75%, which means 75% of Nigerians are working, based on the estimate here, which says our population labor force is 60 million. So 45 million of that, those people are working. That's what we call 75%. That's em employment rates. If you want to calculate unemployment rates, you simply say 15 million divided by 60 million times 100 over 1. Whatever answer you get will become our unemployment rate. And let's take some questions about the labor market. Let's take some questions about employment, unemployment, and underemployment, and all the types. Good. Let's take the first question. It says, the quality of labor force in Nigeria can be improved by... Um, let's look at this. Creating sufficient job opportunities, encouraging the study of science and technology, Establishing more skills acquisition centers, establishing more tertiary institutions. Well, the answer is creating more skills acquisition centers. So when you train more people, when you train them, when you educate them, they tend to get jobs because education is the key to employment. Next question is, a valid explanation for real wage growth is DASH, the rising cost of capital accumulation, the contraction of employment in service industries, an increase in the quantity of labor, an increase in the rate of productivity. So what is the valid explanation for real wage growth? And that is an increase in the rate of productivity, which means how productive you, you are determines how your wage rate will grow. If you're very productive, they'll pay you more. Think about footballers. They score more goals, they pay them more. Um, think about um, all kinds of industries. The more productive you are, the more income you get. Number three says, if Mr. X, Mr. X lost his clerical job at a store and searched for a similar job for 10 months, this implies that he was dash. He was frictionally unemployed, seasonally unemployed, cyclically unemployed, and structurally unemployed. Well, the answer, of this, answer to this is frictionally unemployed. Don't forget, it's about the friction. It's about the time gap between when you get a job and when you turn down a job or when you resign from a job or when you started looking for a job. That's what it is. Number four, the most effective measure to reduce unemployment is to dash. Um, use population control measures, restructure the educational curriculum, diversify the economy, remove administrative constraints. Well, the answer to this is diversify the economy. When you diversify the economy, like a place like Nigeria, when we diversify our economy, it simply means we have other sources of income, we have other businesses that the country is running. With that, we can also reduce unemployment rates. We can reduce the number of people that are not employed. So number five, a major advantage of specialization and division of labor is that when we have division of labor, time wastage will be minimized. Imagine we have so many people and we, they have different areas they specialize. Then that means what? Time wastage will be minimized. Number six, the price paid for labor service is called, this is just too easy. Everybody should know the answer. So the answer is wage rate. The how much you are paid is wage rate. I know there's a, an option there that says salary rate. Well, salary rate is quite um, Kind of, kind of correct, but I will advise you pick wage rate when you see this type of question. Wage rate is a standard um, answer. The seventh question, structural unemployment is mainly caused by a change in consumption pattern, which simply means that when people don't demand for a product anymore, when people don't require or request for a product anymore, then the demand for the labor that produced that product would not be required, would not be needed. So which means that when there is a change in the consumption pattern, of course, people will be structurally unemployed. Imagine that we now have machines that can do a complete massage. And what would happen? All the masseuses you know would be out of jobs. So number eight, a strategy for curbing unemployment is to do what? Which of the following? I think the answer to this one is straightforward. When you increase government expenditure and decrease taxes, then you curb unemployment, which means that when government spends more money, we learn that during budget deficits, when government spends more money on building schools, building roads, those workers on the road make more money, um, they, they have jobs, the, the schools have teachers, they have jobs, 
government employ them and the, when government decreases taxes too people begin to have more money to spend and that creates more employment number nine labor productivity is defined as well that's very easy straightforward outputs of each man per hour or output of each woman per hour so what i can do in one hour determines my productivity and the last question here is which is not a type of unemployment so we have structural unemployment we have cyclical unemployment we have disguised unemployment and we have marginal unemployment of course you can remember that i taught you two out of this we have structural and cyclical disguised unemployment i'll tell you what it is now it means an, an a, a kind of unemployment that exists and people think that it's not there but marginal unemployment is the word that barely exists anywhere in economic dictionary so the answer to this is certainly marginal unemployment so i hope you now understand the key concept of unemployment so economics is driving towards full employment economics wants every sector every economy every country every country to ex experience full employment that means everybody should be employed but that is not very possible because some people will definitely not be employed but as much as you're willing to find a job you should be able to get a job that's the focus of economics to make everyone employed but of course we always have unemployment but if we can keep it at the minimal very low then we have a growing or fruitful economy we've come to the end of this session thank you very much for listening i wish success in your exams